Thank you, Charlie. Thank all of you for coming here and supporting wildlife. Well, Charlie didn't mention one thing, and I thought you were going to talk about that. My fear of heights. I really have a fear of heights. And um, I had to overcome that, um, and I'll tell you a bit about it uh, in a while. But, you know, really the paradigm that I think is a paradigm for human wildlife conflict around the world is that a lot of people, be they agriculturalists or uh, livestock owners, see predators and herbivores as pests. Now, what if we could turn that whole paradigm around and instead of it being a pest, it was an asset to the community and an asset that you know, supported their livelihood, uh, supported their families in terms of income, and, but most important of all, of course, it's leading to a holistic, intact ecosystem, and that's really what we need to be aiming at. So throughout my talk, I'm talking about transforming snorpets from pests into assets, and I want to show you some of the ways of doing it. We don't have a snow leopard up there yet. So another thing that happened is I don't know who did this, whether the snow leopard chose me or I chose the snow leopard. But I was born in South Africa and grew up in Zimbabwe. Here I am. And I was a very shy kid. Uh, but I knew from an early age of seven, I really wanted to study animals. I wanted to be a naturalist. I wanted to be a game warden, but I was too short to be a game warden, so I became a biologist. Part of the time, I climbed rocks like this with friends, so they had to haul me up in a rope. As long as I had a rope, I was safe, but if the rope went, I wasn't. Then I decided with the winds of change in Africa, this is in the late 60s, early 70s, I needed to get a degree. Where better to get a degree than in California with Starker Leopold, Aldo Leopold's son, and off I went to California, I got my degree, one day I picked up National Geographic, fatal mistake, and what do I see but this cat? And you know, what an iconic cat. Who cannot fall in love with this cat? So I said, I've got to go and see the cat and get a better picture than George Charlotte. <laughs> now everybody look at me like crazy. Fortunately, Rolex, I, I, I persuaded an insurance company to give me money to go overseas. I went into a very remote area. I found snow leopards, I realized they were under threat, I realized they needed to be studied. Who else invested in that but Rolex? You know, great risk, but it was a risk well worth taking, I think, partly because I fell in love with the culture of the country. This is Dolfu, we had to walk for 12 days. We had to be above 10,000 feet, up to 16. And in there, I entered two centuries ago, another world. No lights, no bicycles, nothing. I never saw a jet trail for four and a half years, never. But what I was in is this incredible remote wilderness with snow leopards like, it, like this. Tracks up this side, on the other side we put out our traps and within a few days of course we had a snow leopard. What I hadn't done is planned very well because I didn't have a, a dart gun, I had a jab stick and I had to go within three feet of that quite angry cat and immobilize it. But we did do it, and we collared uh, five of them in all over four and a half years, and it was really quite an exciting time. Being nomadic like a snow leopard, following them, you know, they, they're remarkable animals because they just hide. And in the four and a half years, we only saw them once or twice a year, other than our collared cats but we did have radio tracking, ground-based radio tracking, admittedly, that it's quite hard to get a triangulation, but when you do, you're starting to get that vital information of you know, what kind of habitat, where does the animal sleep, where does it go out and hunt, what does it need? And we started building up a picture, slowly. It took a lot of hard work climbing up and down. I would get scared when I get on these cliffs, but I would always, I guess, be cautious and not get myself out too much on a limb. National Geographic got interest after Rolex, and they said, well, if you get a picture, we'll consider a story. But the picture has got to be of a cat with no collar on it or anything like that. I said, oh my god, help me. And they gave me this camera trap up here with a pressure pad, the old physical one that you know walks, you walk through a door store and rings a bell. It was that kind of thing. It didn't ring the bell, but it took the picture. 
we got in the um, two odd and two and a half years of camera trapping, we got three pictures of a snow leopard. We got pictures of Yak, we got pictures of our villager, the blue sheep, but three of snow leopard all walk in the right way, all of which got into the article. I think that was pretty remarkable. Thank you, snow leopards. But what I really learned and what I found most fascinating about these cats was their, they were solitary. They lived alone, they came together for a short mating season, but they were very communicative with one another. They would scuff the ground with their hind feet like this, leave a very distinctive mark which would last a year. They would spray the rocks as they're doing on the right-hand side there. And that scent would tell other snow leopards, you know, the gender, probably the age, probably the individual responsible for it. And so that way they could space themselves out. And they ended up using common real estate, but at different times. So they were really making good use of resources. I kept sticking my head under rocks like this, sniffing the scent, because it was odiferous. It would last for 40 days. I could tell whether it had been revisited or not. The local people thought I'd lost it. <laughs> but it all worked out very well with the cover of National Geographic, with the female that gave birth soon after this picture, and with Darla's book, My Wife. So I would have to say credit to my wife. She helped me write the Rolex uh, uh, application. She became a writer, and there is this book, Vanishing Tracks, which will give you the details of what we did that's now an e-book. So come to our table, and we can put you in touch with that e-book. So where do snow leopards live? A vast area, all the way from southern Siberia, up in the top there, Lake Baikal, you can see, I, I can't see this pointer, all the way down through the now independent, independent Soviet republics of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, Kazakhstan into the Himalayan Karakoram range. This cat is associated with high mountains, the roof of the world, really. You can see in China all that orange. That snow leopard habitat, potential, it's not all occupied, of course, but it is potential habitat. And the cat is basically an international species. It's on these borders that there's a lot of tension. It's very difficult to get into a lot of them. You, you work years for a permit. You get it, you go there, you get arrested because you don't have the right permit. And this is where the Snow Leopard Conservancy works. In 2000, I decided to start my own organization, mostly because I really, really recognized that local people were the future of everything. If they, they needed to be the stewards of their environment. For them to be the stewards, they needed to be empowered and given equal knowledge that scientists have and politicians and so on. Snow leopards, uh, again, I think an iconic species in a huge variety of habitats. So this is Tajikistan in the western Palmyras. They really like rugged areas. In the Himalaya, of course, the core of their range. And they go as high as um, 19, almost 20,000 feet, but mostly between about 12 and 16,000. In Ladakh, this is classic habitat because it has the cliffs and it has the rolling slopes that the prey animals, the blue sheep, the ibex will forage on. The cats will hide on the rocks and stalk their prey. Access is always a huge, huge problem. Um, you remember it took me a week to go to my study area. Well, it hasn't changed that much because there are not many roads in here. And here on this side is walking up the frozen river of Zanskar in Ladakh. We walk for 60 miles. It's very, very dangerous because the ice gives away. It's constantly changing. But it is the main route in and out for the whole population of this region that is some of the best snow leopard habitat you can imagine. In summer, it's very difficult to cross because of these swollen rivers. And you have fiber bridges that, you know, have been there for probably hundreds of years, but I'm kind of a little cautious about them. Renshin has no trouble. <laughs> and so here we have a cat that in my first 25 or 30 years of study, I would be lucky enough to see once a year. 
sure, you would see a lot of sign, a whole lot of sign. But that cat was superb. It, you know, it saw a lot more people than people saw it. Um, so back to the main conflict. What are the threats? And this is really the serious threat. People in this area, 40% live below the poverty line. Most of them are pastoralists. Their livestock is their cash in their bank. And even if they lose a few, a few animals, it's a major impact on them. And especially nowadays with the interest in cashmere and fine uh, fiber for sweaters and so on, people are keeping goats and sheep. And small-bodied livestock are so much more vulnerable to snow leopards who you can't really blame for killing um, the children in this area. If you ask them to draw a snow leopard, this is typically what they would draw. And it comes from the experience of knowing that the cats come at night, kill the family's yak, and the fa parents get very upset about it. But more and more children asking questions, well, why do they kill the yaks? Why do they kill the sheep? What can we do about it? And working with the local people, taking in traditional knowledge and sitting with them, you realize very quickly <laughs> the problem is quite simple. This is a typical corral in Zanskar, and you can see it's a low wall. It's probably a lot of effort to build it, but it works great to keep the livestock in, but not the snow leopard <laughs> from jumping in. And once it jumps in, its you know, killing instinct gets repeatedly triggered until you get this situation. And this happened just a few weeks ago in uh, the kingdom of Mustang in Nepal. Two snow leopards, young snow leopards, inexperienced snow leopards, came along, jumped into the corral, and there were about 25 go, uh, sheep lost. And clearly, you can't expect people to be sympathetic to a predator in this sort of situation. Part of the problem is that the wild prey, and this is the Himalayan tar, so there's three species that are sort of really associated with snow leopards, the blue sheep, the ibex, and something like the Himalayan tar, and smaller things like musk deer. Wonderful animal. This is taken in Mount Everest. But unfortunately, due to the overgrazing, the over, uh, excessive number of livestock, the rangeland is in terrible condition. This is up in Mustang. And wildlife just doesn't have much to eat the wild ungulates. So the populations have been plummeting. And as soon as the Populations plummet, of course. Livestock is the next thing on the list. And then in countries like Russia, and especially the former Soviet Union countries, and near China, where the big mart exists for the musk deer uh, pods from the musk deer, very, very valuable, more valuable than gold by weight, far more, people will set traps. And those traps are non-specific. You know, They're going to get other wildlife, including snow leopard as well, and they do. And you get a situation like this of a snow leopard that has lost its, its fur. This was back in Nepal uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. That fur finds its way into a fur coat. Maybe there would be 10 to 12. Uh, to make this coat, there's possibly $60,000 on the black market, of course, because it's illegal under the CITES, the Convention on International Trade. Now the most recent threat is really on the right-hand side there, the bones. So the bones and the body parts are very valued in China for medicinal purposes, and I think in part to compensate for the increasing scarcity of tiger bone. Tiger bone wine and tonics is something a lot of elderly Chinese really want and are paying money for, and of course the demand far exceeds the supply. What can we do about all of this? What do we need to do? Well, I think one of the key things you start off with is good applied research. You need to know where the snow leopard populations are, what kind of size you're talking about, especially where the hot spots. And it's so wonderful. Camera traps have arrived on the scene. And digital camera traps are cheap. They're very effective. This particular camera was set up by use in, in Nepal that we work with in Mustang. And from the spot patterns on each of the cats. It's very distinctive. And we can recognize the individual, so we get an account. Uh, GPS, radio telemetry, collars, have replaced the old things where I used to walk all day 
and I'll be lucky at the end of the day to get a single location. Now we can program these callers to drop off on demand, to communicate back to us and download the data, to collect uh, locations every few minutes if we want it. The, the limitation becomes battery life. So this is in Mongolia with one of our partners, Munsog, and all our work is done with in-country partners. The results of Tolgador, this is a male, and I was interested in him because he lived on an isolated mountain. This is about 30, 40 km, km across and about 70 km up and down. Well, it's about 35, 40 miles, something like that. And I really wanted him to leave that mountain and go to the next mountain because I wanted to see how they disperse over large landscapes. Of course, he'd been a snow leopard. He'd been a cat. He wasn't going to do that. He stayed on that mountain range. So we still got to do more studies. What about the depredation? This is the real simple solution. It really is simple. All we got to do is make those corrals predator-proof. It keeps the livestock safe. Nothing can get in. And even if a snow leopard jumped up on the wall and the incredible jumpers, 15, 16 feet, is no trouble, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And you get happy herders like this. So this is Tashi Langel. I mean, his livelihood is on those massive sheep and goats. I wish he'd keep fewer. I'm really trying to persuade him to. Um, but he now is so happy because instead of sleeping on the ground, on the cold ground, very cold ground, and watching over his flock at night, he can go home and be with the family. And so immediately his attitude to snow leopards is going to dramatically change, and it does. But you have to do it right. So when we started working in Ladakh um, in the, you know, about 2003, 2004, and put in these corrals up, an NGO came to us and said, well, gosh, you're using four walls. We can use three walls, and it'll be a lot cheaper, and we can do more of them. And then they did it, and the herders refused to put their animals in there. And, you know, the herders are not stupid. They would know that a snow leopard would just happily come jumping down there into the feeding pen and be a, snow, a cat with bad habits. <laughs> so it's really important, I think, to involve the local people. After all, they have knowledge. We have scientific knowledge, which they don't have. But together, the traditional knowledge and the scientific knowledge is going to lead to greater knowledge. But more important than all of that, it builds the ownership amongst that community, amongst the stewards, that it is their cat, that it is their heritage for their kids that they need to be protecting. And what do we do about all these corrals? Because there's thousands of them, and it cost an enormous amount of money. Well, we are starting to work now with electronic devices. So this is something called Fox Lights. It's made in Australia, and it's a flashing LED light. It's like a disco show. It's very bright. It's very irregular, and it's somewhat confusing. And we are hoping that it will take time, maybe a lot of time, for a snow leopard or any predator to become habituated to it and to stay away from those lights. That's an experiment in progress right now. And the herders are happy. So far, this is a Nepali herder that has one up. So hopefully, this will buy us time to begin to look into alternative non-lethal sort of ways of managing human-wildlife conflict. We also want to look into the uh, veterinary care, try to increase the health of the herd so that there are fewer animals out on the range, so that the rangeland plants can recover and there can be better uh, productivity and carrying capacity over time. But ultimately, when you are dealing with people whose annual income is around four to $500 a year, you have to think about jobs. You have to, and you don't want them migrating out, especially. And tourism, I think, offers a, a suitable solution as long as it is done sensitively and right. And I would have to thank woman, the Ladakhi woman here. Uh, they came up with this idea of a parachute cafe, Coca-Cola stop, and biscuits. But out of that, they get some money. They use it for their, uh, their own needs. And you know they saving through using these solar heaters. They saving those saving those plastic bottles being deposited everywhere. But the most brilliant idea I think again came from a local woman, 
And they said, well, we could run B&Bs, homestays, bed and breakfast. And they have quite big houses, you can see. They put aside a room for $10 to $15 a night. You can go and stay there. They'll give you three very simple meals. You bring your sleeping bag. They'll give you a mattress. But of the classic thing that you have out of that is that you can have a cultural interaction. You can see how Ladakhis live, and you can interact with their kids, or bite with a little limited English. But you know, Ladakhis are learning English more and more, and so there's going to be more and more exchanges. The other activity that some, who's in the audience here, helped start is something called Savings and Credit. So this is an organization in Mount Everest, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit, little bit later because of the earthquake. But these women got together, and every family is saving a few cents each month into a communal fund of which they are equal shareholders. They loan that money out to themselves with certain guarantees for entrepreneurial activities. And they, the interest that they're gaining from loaning to one another is coming back to them. If they wanted a loan, they go into the market, it's 30% or 25% interest. So clearly, you, you're indebted for life with that system. So this is another way of increasing income amongst the rural people. And it all leads to good things, I think. If the first thing these women do with their money is send their kids to a proper school so they have a good education. Um, and they reinvest back into the homestays. I think that's important. Money goes into a communal fund. Money goes, and we help support them with educational materials like this. These are books written in the local language, often authored by local kids. My grandmother says it's been done in about four languages now, including Braille in Lhasa, Tibet. So, very important. Another program that came out of Nepal recently, in like three years ago now, is to put young youths from high school kids together with herders. You can see the herder barely on the right-hand side there. The kids are learning to do camera trapping. And, you know, they know about IT. They can understand these things. The herder, of course, his knowledge is where do snow leopards move and walk. And so he can help them where, they, where to put the cameras. And we do environmental camps, and the idea is to start uh, educating people about their own ecosystems, which they know very little about, because the education system deals actually, ironically, with livestock from, in, from England or something, nothing local. Painting, exercises. But what they get most fun out, of course, is setting up the cameras and seeing what animals they catch. And you get people like this, uh, Ramesh Sina. He's a young kid. He lives out in the village. I think he wants to stay in the village. But he will think nothing of climbing up five, 6,000 feet in a day, 15 miles, to go and retrieve that memory card in the camera and exchange it and bring back to the, the monitor. So that sort of thing we encourage. They get pictures like this, regular ones of snow leopards after a snowstorm up in the Jomson area proof that the snow leopards are indeed uh, breeding in the area. And most interestingly, information that confounds scientists. So this is a common leopard taken north of the main Himalayan range. And absolutely every scientist, without exception, in Nepal would say, no way do common leopards go north of the Himalayas. Well, the kids show otherwise. <laughs> And so I think things like uh, youth education, citizen science, and the Snorbet Scouts are really a win-win win situation. What has it done? How has it changed seeing snow leopards? Well, remember, once a year I would see snow leopards. Now, in 10 days, I can see seven snow leopards, of which six are different. In, in this place in Ladakh, where we've done all the community work, and I'm totally convinced it's because people no longer harass that cat, that it is able to come out, and so the people see almost more snow leopards than snow leopards see people. Not quite. But all of our trips have, have had great success. We run trips there in the winter, uh, and the funds from those trips go to support the local conservation effort. So this female I spent two years ago, 50 yards all day away from, she sat up 
When she wasn't feeding on a kill, she sat up on the rock here watching us. We are watching her. She is more agitated over this goddamn magpie <laughs> that uh, is after her meat. Uh, you know, snow leopards have a tough time killing, and they're going to stay on that kill until literally it stinks like hell, there's nothing left. And so she comes down, and the magpie goes flying. We kind of wonder if we couldn't train magpies to find snow leopards. <laughs> The fur trade, yeah, clearly we need to do something about the illegal poaching. And, you know, uh, increasing the income levels of people, of course, will reduce any incentive for selling furs. And especially if there's education in the community, they will not do it. But I think the biggest challenge is where you have a professional poacher. So Mergen Murkov is a professional poacher. He lives in the Altai in Russia. He has poached snow leopards all his life. So is his father, so is his grandfather. And they basically, them and a number of other poachers, led to essentially the excupation of snow leopards from a particular area. We would go in and we would remove the snares, but next year more snares would come up, or fewer, but there would still be snares. What could we do? And Misha, the program manager in Russia there, had the brilliant idea, well, let's hire the poacher. Let's make him into a, a conservationist, a camera trapper. And that's essentially what we've done. He's getting the same amount of money. He doesn't have to worry about whether you know, the law enforcement will be on his neck any time. And he's able to get photographs like this and show us areas that we didn't think have snow leopards, that he, in fact, is collecting them. Our check on him is that we've got individual spot patterns of snow leopards. So we know if there's a decline. We know, and we can start asking questions. But I think he's far happier to be a conservationist. Um, so I'm running a little slow here. Now, where do we go next? Well, what we want to do is after all this time in Nepal, the original study, we want to come back and use the new technology to work on the cats there. And we want to work in this area. This is the Annapurna Conservation Area, the first community-managed conservation area in the world. And it looks like this. This is the sort of sense of the terrain. And across those ridges and in those valleys are a good number of snow leopards. There is human conflict there. And that's something we want to start addressing. And we want to start bringing in tourism so that more people could. And lo and behold, what would happen two weeks ago is a catastrophic earthquake. And I don't know how this is going to change our plans. I know we need to adapt to it. But I think you've all read the newspapers recently and seen the TV. And you know how devastating this is. Something like 8,000 people killed and about 14,000 injured. But house after house demolished by the aftershocks especially. And this is a house in Tommy. I showed you the savings and credit group. This is the group that have lost about 70% of their houses in the community. And now they're having to live outside. They're going to obviously have to rebuild uh, before you know, the monsoon's coming up soon. They're going to be in tents quite clearly. It takes time to rebuild. What I would love to do with your support is be able to put additional money into their savings and credit program so that they can rebuild rapidly and recover, and do that in the name of snow leopards. So this, I, this cat is just so incredibly beautiful. I'm so glad it chose me in a way, because I should have gone back to Africa. I really wanted to go back to Africa and study the common leopard. But thanks George, thanks National Geographic, I saw the photograph. And thanks to WCN and all supporters like you that have been supporting our work, that we've been able to do what we've been doing. And lately, we're into some couple of new things, bringing in the um, religious leaders, the monks, the shamans, the sacred site guardians. I think poets, writers, and these sort of people need to be added their names need to be added to the scientists and the biologists to come up with solutions that value animals, truly value living animals. And this particular rock has snow leopards on it, engraving spectrograph, and it has ibex, and it's worshipped very highly amongst an increasing number of people in Kyrgyzstan. So let's expand this network to include them. 
Our goal being the next generation of snow leopards, cats like this, that are wandering the high trails, often livestock trails, as you can see going across here. I'm going to point out oops, something there. You can see something there. So this, land, this cat <laughs> likes to clean the lands. It was part of a nature series, and it's done up in Ladakh above the homestays. <laughs> Early morning, so the mist is, the breath of the cat is, is going to clear, thank goodness. And you're going to see the other feature of snow leopards in one minute that I think is quite exciting, really. I just, I, to me, that's all about the snow leopard. One sec. So it's, it's checking this out, what's going on. And it decides, no threat, it doesn't knock it over, try to bite it. And look at that tail. I mean, wouldn't you like a tail like that? <laughs> it's incredible. So we are really working hard with the local people to give the snow leopards a future. Um, I'll take questions, but I want to uh, just introduce two people first. One is uh, Dr. Som Ali. I don't know where you are. Back here. Som is the Nepal program uh, director, so he's responsible. <laughs> Thank you. And, and as you get older, you need to work on the next generation. So the other person who would be helping me move SLC into the next level would be Dr. Quinton Martins from South Africa, who worked on Leopard. <laughs> we'll just have a brief word. I don't know if you can use this. <laughs> so, I don't know if yeah, it's great. on. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, and um, I don't know how you guys feel, but like, I just feel so privileged to be able to sit in um, on a talk like this from one of the legends in conservation in the world. I think we just need to give Rodney another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just briefly, Rodney and I have got a couple of things in common. One is that we're both from South Africa, um, and I've lived in South Africa my whole life and just moved to the States this year to work with Rodney. Um, the other is we both started our studies, me on mountain leopards in South Africa and Rodney on, on snow leopards, but um, by people, experts in their fields, telling us that it was going to be impossible to, to work on these animals because it was so difficult. So when I was doing my PhD on mountain leopards in South Africa, I had Rodney's PhD next to, next to my desk, and I was just remember like having my Bible there, you know, going, oh, what did Rodney say, you know? And it was so amazing, you know, and it took me a year before I saw my first leopard out in the field, and, you know, if reading Vanishing Tracks um, is such an amazing book because it really gives you insight into the incredible hardships that, that Rodney and his wife, Darla, had to endure to to study one of the most elusive, enigmatic, and iconic scat, uh, scats, cats. Cats, <laughs> yeah, not scats. Well, their scats are iconic from a genetic point of view. <laughs> but um, one of the most iconic scat, uh, cats in the world. Um, and, and like Gary, um, Gary Wolf was saying earlier, you know, just that these cats really represent something so much bigger in terms of broader ecosystem conservation, using them as these umbrella species, these flagship species, keystone species, and working with communities, I think the work that Sam has done and Rodney with the Snow Leopard Conservancy have done with um, really building the capacity and having people benefit from, from wildlife is absolutely amazing. So thank you for your work, thank Rodney. You. Thank you well, for the next generation. So, thank you. Uh, we, we have some time for questions. I, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I noticed like in that video the cat was like getting really close to the camera. Have you ever had incidences where the cats actually like mess up, up the cameras or like break them? Or well, are they specifically set where they wouldn't be able to like destroy them type thing? No, we haven't. We, we like to conceal our cameras. So we put them in a rocky cairn and we have a, a pretty heavy rock on top. But I do know of another conservation uh, organization that had a camera stolen by a snow leopard, and they've never found it. <laughs> it a cub came along and it liked it, and it, you, all you see is a cub carrying the camera away, and that's that. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. Quentin to remind me. Yeah, you can visit our website, contact us. We'll be at, down uh, at the tables. I'm happy to talk to any, any of you. And I also want to thank our sponsors. Oops. What, Quinton? What have you done? There we are. <laughs> Oops. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any other questions? What? Aha, uh -huh. now you're asking an interesting question. Yeah, I, I was born British, um, and I was adamant about keeping my British citizenship. I came to this country, you know, fully expecting to go back, but of course all the snow leopard changed things. And, you know, it's hard to live through an election and not vote. And when Clinton came along for the second time, I said, sorry, bye-bye Britain, hello US. <laughs> I was going to vote. So that's what happened. I, I became an American citizen. <laughs> um, hi, so I don't know if you talked at all about population trends in the snow leopard um, species, but they definitely are an endangered species. So since you've started your work with them, have you seen an increase in the number of snow leopards, or has it stayed relatively the mm, same? Yeah. Thank you for that question. I didn't mention how many snow leopards there are out there, and you know, this is where we don't really know. We figure somewhere between about 3,000 and 7,500. Uh, there are hot spots where they are, are more dense than other areas, but we don't have an historic baseline except for the area of occupied habitat uh, to judge the trend against. And unfortunately, Snow leopard density varies enormously from place to place. And even in areas where you would think it's not great snow leopard, there can be a higher density than in habitat that has a prey and everything you would think would have a good. So extrapolating is really difficult. And I have great hope that one day uh, scats, scats, scats <laughs> will provide us an answer. So it's really easy to go and collect the scats of snow leopards. They mark and in distinctive areas. They travel along distinctive routes. The problem is that politically, scats are hot material, and you can't transport them across borders to the, where the labs are. And to have a genetics lab that can do the sophistication of analysis, it's of course not a cheap proposition. And politicians don't seem to know that. They say, well, no, Nepal scats stay in Nepal, you know, India scats <laughs> stay in the, India, et cetera. So we're still not at the point where we can do a range-wide assessment quickly. But I suspect there may be more out there than we realize. Yeah. Do livestock depredations take place only at night at the corral and in uh -huh. areas where uh, leopards are not harassed? Are they more diurnal? That's a good question. Um, leopards change their behavior depending uh, whether they harass by people or not. So in Mongolia and Russia, they're pretty uh, distinctively nocturnal. As you move south along the Himalaya, they seem to be coming more uh, crepuscular, active early morning, late afternoon. Now the problem with corrals is the fact that you get in multiple killings for every incident because the livestock cannot escape. On the normal open range and with normal prey, of course, a snow leopard can kill one or two prey animals, but that's all. The rest of them get away. And the herders are quite willing to tolerate that occasional depredation. Uh, and they do look after their herds. Um, the, the problem is that when they get into a corral that might uh, constitute something like only 10% of the incidence of depredation, it amounts for like 60% of the actual losses. So that's where you need to start controlling that, I guess, is with the corrals. But you can't do every one, because there's thousands of them. And this is why we were talking about the fox lights. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, uh, first, I think, in Nepal, said, uh, this is great. I don't have to kill snow leopards now. And this will make me a better Buddhist. Is in the Buddhist religion, is there a special status Uh -huh. I, uh -huh. So in the Buddhist religion, do snow leopards have a, spe a special status? Well, as many of you may know, Buddhists really uh, value life. And there are Buddhists, practicing Buddhists, 
that will do everything they can not to walk over ants or insects because they believe in a way it's, it's life and a way, you know, it's valued life. And if you take it away, um, you might reduce your chances of an, a good afterlife. You may come back as an insect. Um, and so they want to do everything they can to coexist harmoniously with, um, you know, all wildlife. Snow leopards in a few places, yes, they seem to have a stronger, uh, uh, spiritual or, or a power connection, I guess. And there have been instances where uh, a herder has killed a snow leopard out of retribution because of loss of livestock and then has suffered catastrophic family things. You know, a lot of members of the family just suddenly die for no reason at all. And the community has made the connection back that that's the spirit of the snow leopard and the power of the snow leopard. And the snow leopard really is one of our deities who may be overlooking the welfare of this entire area. So, you know, we need to respect and coexist with it. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you. Thank you.